Welcome to Self Made, entrepreneurs who turn their ideas into dollars. Now, here's your host, Jason Bax. Before we meet today's self made entrepreneur, a quick message. If you've ever wanted to escape the cubicle and live the laptop lifestyle by starting a blog, then grab yourself a copy of the Blog Profits Blueprint for free and learn exactly what it takes to start from zero and grow to $10,000 a month from someone who's actually done it, a friend of mine who's made over a million dollars online blogging. My friend's going to show you in his guide the exact steps he took to get his blog off the ground. How to choose your blog topic, combining what you love and what other people on the internet are looking for. That's very, very important. And how he turned his blog into a real business. So you only need to work two to three hours a day and still make big money blogging. You can go and download the Blog Profits Blueprint in PDF by going to jasonbacks.com forward slash blog blueprint. That's jasonbacks.com. That's Bax with an X forward slash blog blueprint. Now, to the interview. Today's self-made entrepreneur is the founder of virtualmissfriday.com, Michelle Dale. Michelle, thanks for being on Self-Made. What the heck is your big idea? Okay, my big idea was, started about 10 years ago, to provide services online to business owners and other entrepreneurs. And... um, do it to basically fund uh, my travels around the world. Which you took your kids with you. Yeah, I actually had my kids on the road. Three of them. <laughs> Three of them. A husband yeah. or anything like a partner? Yeah, I met my husband. He's from California, but we met in Egypt. And um, I had three kids all in different countries. So um, my big, yeah, my big idea was definitely had to be internet based. Um, So it started there, you know, researching the things I could possibly do online to make some money and online services seemed the most pertinent at the time. Um, And then basically the fuel behind it was the whole, the whole travel scene, which I'm very, very into right now. So how are you doing? Give us some numbers, please. Okay, so it's it's kind of like, okay, you want numbers. I'm going to split this into several parts. First of all, I have a service business. Okay, so this is where it all started. Um, and I published reports on my website. So I'm making around $30,000 a month in services. Um, direct services, and that is selling, um, not all me doing it. <laughs> I have staff that I hire um, and I outsource, um, but that's all in the house of my company. And then I have the product side of the business. So after I started getting really good at selling services and making that kind of money, people wanted to know how they actually did it. So then I started selling training products and programs, and you know that brings in a steady income of, say, around $5,000 a month. But When I do product launches, you know, it can bring in between sort of 10 and 30,000 in one hit. So if you put it all together and piece it all together, it's variable, but, you know, it's well into the six figures. And are there any other buckets? You said services, you have product and training. Services, products and training. I also do sort of affiliate promotions with people. Um, in the industry as well, but you know, I tend, I tend to call that my pocket money when I do things like that, because it's aside from, you know, my regular stuff. I I tend to only count the things that I can really control in my business, which is the, my own products I create, my own services I sell. Um, yeah, so we're doing pretty good at the moment. Um, we've got a small team of people. There's about 14 people working in the business right now. Um, are they all virtual? All virtual, yeah, and all around the world. Um, I have clients and staff across six con- uh, six continents, and um, yeah, we're all we're, we're all doing pretty good, you know. And I think a lot of people think that it's not possible to to make so much money from something as you know humble as virtual assistants. But you know, I think there's money to be made in anything if you've got the right you know the right attitude towards it. Now, what is the right attitude? And I, I'm intensely interested in knowing how you hire, how you, how, because it sounds like you are pretty accomplished in this, just judging by your revenues. And this is a, just talk about what's the right attitude. 
the right attitude is to be a solution oriented person, to always um, be of the mindset that there is a solution to every problem. A lot of people go into a business initially with so much negativity, like it's they're setting it themselves up for, to prepare for the worst in everything. And then a lot of people who are naysayers and things like that say, oh, well, you know, you shouldn't really do that or, you know, that probably won't work. And then people don't even and try. It's like they don't even get past the first point. And I think the what you should do is approach everything, everything in your business with the attitude that there is a solution or, a, or there is a way to overcome any challenge. Even if it's never been done before, it's because nobody's ever tried hard enough to get it done. So you have to be the person that takes that step forward and goes that step further when no one else has done it. And um, that's kind of what I do on a daily basis um, in terms of my own business. And give us an example in your own business of some solution that you came up with that's never been done before or maybe some major obstacle that you had to overcome. Sure. Well, a lot of people think that virtual assistance is kind of isolated to, um, you know, people like in the Philippines or India and, you know, there are a bunch of people working for three or four dollars an hour and stuff like that. And of course there are, but it doesn't have to be like that. You know, you get people assisting other people in in the real world, should we call it, you know, who are earning extremely good salaries for executive assistance and personal assistance and things like that. So what I wanted to do is kind of transfer that online and take virtual assistance more to an entrepreneurial level. Um, in terms of using virtual assistants and using outsourcing and charging premium prices for what we do. And what you have to do is really is focus on the quality of the service and providing as much value as you possibly can. Um, and then once you do that, you can obviously start charging a lot more. So it's a lot of people think to themselves that, you know, nobody will ever pay you know, $50 an hour or $100 an hour for a virtual assistant. But if the virtual assistant is providing the equivalent or more of value to the, the customer, then of course they're going to pay it. I am very curious about that because it seems that in the virtual assistant world, if we use that big basket, that it's a real commodity. It's a real race to the bottom right now. And I noticed you're charging premium prices. Do you, are you at all concerned about this horrific trend uh, in pricing and the increase in supply of virtual assistants as or, or and how do you compete um, well, i've always been kind of the thought that there are no competitors um, in what I'm doing. There are people who do the same thing, but they don't do it the way I do it. So I think if you, if you get scared of the competition, like for example, a lot of corporate companies do it. I work with a lot of corporate companies and they come to me and they say, oh, we can't really do this and we can't tweet about that and we can't do this because, you know, the competition might see it and then the competition are going to swoop in and steal that idea from us and then, you know, we're going to hand over a chunk of business to them. The best thing that you could possibly do is always try and be better than anybody else and then you have no competition. It's all about striving on a daily basis to do the absolute best you possibly can, to develop your business, to provide more value than anyone else, to do better than anyone else and then really there is there is, if you work harder than anybody else to make your brand and your product and your service the best, then really, you know, there is no competition for it. And how, what do you do to make your service and business the best? I focus on the customer. I focus every day in everything I do on on my customers and my clients and how I could possibly do something better for them. And I also focus a lot on myself, on self-development. You know, how can I become better at what I'm doing? Um, how can I improve myself? And I'm very much somebody who likes to lead by example rather than just talk. So what I'll tend to do is I'll have ideas, I'll go and try them, I'll, I'll find new ways of doing things. And then when I do that, I pass it on. So it, it kind of makes you the go-to person um, for things in your industry that nobody else is doing because you're the only one stepping out there and, and really trying it. So I just, every day on a daily basis, try to improve myself and improve my service, my clients, my business. I do it through research. I do it through, you know, listening to podcasts like 
yours, Jason, and I, you know, going on webinars and just, and if I, I think to myself, if I can go on one webinar, I will listen to one podcast and I get at least one good idea from it, then, you know, it's been absolutely worth it. And I'll think about how I can implement that into my business. What's the biggest shift in beliefs or mindset that you've had that has had the biggest breakthrough or change in your, in your business? I think the biggest shift for me was to really understand that you are kind of the master of your own destiny. And when you are going into anything, whether it be, you know, a relationship or a business or anything, if you're expecting the worst to happen, then it probably will likely happen. If you're expecting the best to happen, then it probably will. So in terms of mindset, I constantly try to expect the best. I constantly keep in a positive frame of mind because if you're you're constantly in that kind of lack mindset where things are going to go wrong or things aren't going to work, then it's not going to, you know, basically you're attracting that into your life. It's not going to happen. So I, I just keep focusing on the end goal. I keep focused on the outcome of what I want to see. If I want something to change in my business, if I want to earn more money from a certain area in my business, I will focus on the amount of money that I want to earn. And then basically I will listen to my intuition and my guidance and focus on the outcome and move towards it. So Michelle, before we dive into how you find excellent virtual assistants and how you hire them and how you manage them, which I know any successful entrepreneur wants to know. I have several people request that I interview people just like yourselves because we have a challenge, a big problem, a big pain point, a major headache, which is finding reliable, dependable service providers to help us in our business. But before I ask that, I got to know, and I think a lot of people who are listening to this want to know, how did you get into this business? Where did you find the idea and how did you get it off the ground? Okay. So it was about 10 years ago. I was 23 years old. I was working every hour under the sun. A lot of it was commission. It was, it was the usual story. You know, it's the usual, I hate my job. Um, I'm fed up type of story. And, um, one day I came home, I'd been married. I was, I was in a very short marriage. It was five months. I came home. I found all my house cleared out and the guy I was married to gone, um, literally. And so at that point, you know, you're sitting, uh, you're sitting on an empty, carpet in the living room floor. And I just kind of had this epiphany that this, you know, enough was enough. I didn't really like my life anyway, how it was. And I just thought I, I want to do something to change it. Um, and I worked really, really hard. I mean, from a very young age, I worked really hard. I quit school at 16. So, you know, probably harder than most. Um, so I had this idea that I would kind of take a sabbatical. I would go away for a while or forever. I don't know. So I sold my house. I quit my job at the time and I booked a one-way ticket. Um, out to Egypt. And when I got there, it was just like, um, you know, this is all about money. And, you know, I understand that, but really freedom is priceless. Freedom, my freedom was a new currency for me. Um, And once I had that freedom, then I decided that I wanted to keep it and I needed a way to fund my travels. So I would do a lot of research online. Um, I was coming up with all these various ideas, you know, blogging and what entrepreneurs were doing online and stuff like that. And back then, you know, 10 years ago, it was all real kind of cheesy internet marketing stuff, you know. (laughs) (laughs) A lot of it still is, isn't it? (laughs) Yeah, I know. There's a lot of people who haven't moved on, but... um, (laughs) Yeah, so I kind of skipped over all that cheesy stuff and I thought, you know, what could I do with my own skill set, you know, working in offices and office manager roles and things like that, you know, online. And that's when I stumbled across virtual assistants. And I was so shocked and horrified, really, um, at how sort of bland it all was back then. I mean, nobody was really doing too much of it and it, we didn't hit the big four-hour work week phenomenon just yet when I started. Right. Um, once, you know, Tim Ferriss wrote his book, then, you know, it all kicked off and everyone was like, everyone wanted a virtual assistant. It was like an accessory. So um, have you ever thanked him personally for that? <laughs> no, I haven't. But I keep mentioning him all the time in, you know, <laughs> in things that I do in my programs and stuff like that. So I, I, I was so envious when that book came out. People kept handing it to me even on the plane when I was traveling and speaking about 
online marketing that I did that. I flew all over the world and, uh, and people are trying to hand me this book. I'm like, that is the, that's the cheesiest title I've ever heard. Get it away from me. I'm not interested in virtual assistants. Yeah. You know, big, big shocker. I, I use them all the time. And then I read it and I was like, oh my God, I can't believe how big the, the how, how it has exploded. And it was like an epiphany to a lot of people. And so I was just kind of envious as to, because he was a guy who sort of like, sort of introduced it to the market and is did obviously has done very very well he's a very bright guy but yeah well i remember reading it and i was like oh my god that's what i do <laughs> yeah that's right yeah <laughs> <laughs> why am i at this big <laughs> right exactly so, well, so you yeah. know how i feel yeah definitely definitely anyway that that kind of kicked it all off and um you know i, I started really thinking to myself well you know it's got so much exposure how can i how can i use that to to my best advantage and then you know it actually gave me the idea ironically that book gave me the idea to start hiring my own virtual assistants and <laughs> no <laughs> that yeah. sounds bizarro I know because I was a virtual assistant. It never occurred to me to start hiring and start expanding. So I have Tim to thank for that idea. You know, it's like one of those moments where you go, <laughs> why didn't I think of that? It's it's almost like don't ever over underestimate a basic idea. <laughs> yeah, I know. Right? <laughs> yeah, totally. So, so yeah, I mean, if you want to talk about hiring, that's basically where it all started. And I went through some disastrous you Talk know, about one of those disastrous events. How uh, well, you know, I started reading this book and I thought, well, you know, this is fantastic. I can mm. hire, you know, these people out in the Philippines for $3 an hour or something. Right. And you know, so that's what I did. That's what I started doing. And it was just, it was terrible. You know, they would disappear to funerals for three months and never contact you. And yes. <laughs> yes. What is with these month-long funerals? I know. <laughs> you know, my uncle died and it's like, it's been three months. You haven't even emailed me back. And, um, you know, you know, also hiring people out in India and, you know, I, I don't want to stereotype anybody. I do work with people in India and the Philippines, <laughs> but, you know, I just thought, well, Hey, I could just go and hire anyone. Uh, so not the case. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, that, that's where my journey started. And, um, I mean, not easily, I could have given up then, you know, after those, you know, several disasters, but I thought, no, there's got to be something more, you know, more to this. Now I just thought maybe I'm looking in the wrong places. So what I did is I started to think to myself about who I would like to work with, who I think might be good. And I could really only ever think of offline people. So I thought, well, what if I could somehow introduce virtual assistants to people working in the, you know, the, the offline world, in the real world, shall we say? Um, and, you know, perhaps if I could somehow train those people and provide them with, you know, the freedom, the kind of freedom that I had that, you know, was very appealing to a lot of people, particularly mums, you know, there was a lot of mums out there who are giving up their executive PA jobs, that type of thing, who want to still be able to work, but, you know, just don't know how, and they don't want to leave their kid at home. So, um, I kind of started targeting people saying, Hey, do you know about this virtual assistant thing? And that's how it started. So I was able to hire, um, you know, people offline and introduce them to the online world for a much better price than virtual assistants who who were already online. Um, in terms of, you know, and then I started to think to myself, well, I really want to get this, you know, Filipino Indian thing down, and you know, so, any other. So hold on, before Go. you before you mention that one, uh, were you targeting people offline through print ads? How did you target those people? Words of mouth. I mean, I would ask my clients who who they worked with in the past, you know, my clients I had, if they knew any good PAs or, you know, if they knew of anybody. And then I, I found this really great PA who was actually an old former PA of one of my clients. And she knew loads of other, uh, you know, mums, you know, in the, from the school playground who were really interested in it. Um, so I had a few, you know, a few really good BAs come from there who I just trained and, you know, it was, it was, it worked out so well because they were so sort of grateful to be introduced to a solution, which allowed them to work and to also be able to stay at home with their children, which was very important to them. I didn't have kids at the time. Um, so I didn't really understand it, but now I do because I have three. So um, yeah, that's basically how it all started. And there are other ways that I hire. I mean, Odesk came on the scene and, you know, I've, I use Odesk quite a bit. 
Um, and, you know, just again, word of mouth, I have virtual assistant groups and networks now who people who take my training programs and I hire a lot from from there. So I think it's about finding your sources and always, you know, if we're moving on to how do you find your VAs, it's, it's all down to the questions that you ask, really. Before you get into that, tell your Indian and Filipino uh, story and then we'll we'll talk about how to the questions that you ask. <laughs> I wanted to get back. I interrupted you and I, I it's a bad <laughs> habit. But it had to be done. Now tell that story. Okay. Now, really, it was it was just a case that I wanted to find. I really wanted to find a way to utilize um, the kind of Indian Filipino market. Or you know, don't forget. I mean, I, I wasn't sitting there in Monaco or anything. You know, hiring. I was actually in Egypt at the time. You know, which is technically a third world country. So I was very much aware that you know at that time paying someone three dollars an hour was a perfectly adequate wage for where you know, they were living. I was living somewhere where $3 an hour was a heck of a lot more money than most people were making on, on their average wages. So I think having that insight of living in a third world country um, really allowed me to kind of get past that. A lot of people have issues with, oh my God, I'm paying someone, you know, a few dollars an hour. But that's not your problem. It's down to them to actually charge what they feel is worth. A lot of people don't charge what, a lot of people don't value themselves and therefore they're unable to charge what, you know, what they really feel that they should be getting. And again, that's another thing about premium pricing for virtual assistants that, you know, you will get in line, you will get paid equivalent to how much you value your own service and yourself. You know, I can't put a service out there, which I don't think is worth the amount of money that's being paid for it. Um, so we've got things like, you know, economy and valuing yourself and things like that. Anyway, I started looking at ways I could potentially hire people from these third world countries, but you know, what could I potentially do for them to make them better, um, at what they're doing and what could I potentially do to sort of limit my disasters in the hiring arena? Cause there were plenty of those. <laughs> <laughs> well, okay. Let's talk now. First of all, if you if you want to skip the hiring of individual virtual assistants, then go to virtualmissfriday.com. I'm sure Michelle has uh, will have a handful, if not a bucketful, of very experienced former personal assistants, now virtual assistants that you can hire to help you in your business. But I'm kind of interested in the how the kind of questions you ask in order to bring a really find and hire really experienced people that are going to do a great job. Okay. So yeah, I mean, it is all about the questions that you ask, but you got to do a little bit of groundwork first. Mm. So, um, first of all, you have to be absolutely clear on the job that you have available, what, what you actually specifically want done. I mean, I'm not talking about, I need a virtual assistant. I'm talking about what do you need that virtual assistant to do specifically? What, you know, what jobs don't you want to do anymore? You know, you really need to get clear on what you want, because if you're not clear on what you want, you won't get what you actually need at the end of it. You'll get something that kind of is a bit half-assed or, you know, semi what you need. So get really, really clear on that. Then once you're clear on that, you have to write out a very specific job description about the kind of person that you're looking for to fill that, the kind of characteristics that they need, their availability, um, that type of thing. Because everyone has this idea that all virtual assistants are the same and they're not. And, you know, obviously in my business, I match uh, VAs, I match professionals to the task and not to the client. So I have a pool of people with different skills in my business. And basically, you know, we've got web, de web designers, developers, you know, admin, social media, that type of thing. And then I will have my whole team working on one client. Because if, when you match the task to the client, you get a much better result than if you kind of have a generic one size fits all. So that's what makes my service a little bit different in terms of virtual assistants because, you know, I kind of manage a team of people and that works very well. So I would either suggest that you, you know, you try not to hire a, a one size fits all kind of person, um, try to hire people for their skills or come for somebody like me or another online business manager who already has a team of 
train professionals in those individual fields. So when you go and say, right, I need, I need content created. I need my social media done. I need my work on my website. You know, there's not one person trying to, you know, shimmy around and do all this stuff. There are, there are actually different people working on these different tasks. A, it gets the job done much quicker and B, it gets done to a much higher standard. So that's, you know, get really clear and specific on what you want. And then you've got to go through this whole uh, process of finding the person. So obviously the, the most obvious place is these people for higher sites, you know, like Odesk and Elance and Microlance and, and places like that. So that's a really, really good place to start. I've never pitched for business on there myself, but I have hired from there myself. So the best thing to do is to um, start, you know, put out your job description. But you also want to make sure um, that when you put that job description out, ask a specific question in there that somebody has to answer, okay? Because that will really test somebody's ability to read um, what they they are actually doing and actually respond to the question. Because a, so a lot of people reply back to the job just saying, yeah, yes, sir, I, I can do this job. And they just copy and paste some crap and send it back to you. So you're looking yeah. to weed those people out. Is that right? <laughs> you you have to filter, yeah. Right. And this is a, you, how you set your job description up is really the, the starting base of how you filter. Mm. So first of all, um, you, you want to always make sure you mention your name a couple of times in there. You know, my name my name is Michelle, um, you know, and say it at the end, you know, contact me, my Michelle, da, da, da. And then you want to make sure you ask a specific question. And then you want to make sure that people you ask specifically on another section that people relay their experience in the specific job that you're asking for. Okay. So, you know, like you can post out there, you know, I want a social media assistant and you'll get someone come back going, I have a lot of experience in web development. I don't care. <laughs> I don't give a social media. So, so really make sure that you ask the person to come back to you and say, when you respond back to me, tell me specifically what experience you have in this particular job or whatever, or task or project. And then what you do is you get back, like you say, you get back all those kind of dear sir, madam, or, you know, and so many people call me Mr. You know, Mr. Michelle. Or... I love the one which is dear. Do you ever get that? Yeah. Yes, dear. Like, where? Yeah, dear or friend, my friend. <laughs> yeah. So basically you eliminate all those people who don't call you by your name. First of all, you get rid of them. You eliminate all the people who haven't relayed back to you the specifics of what their experience in the task that you're offering. Because if they haven't relayed specifics, either they didn't read it or they don't have any specific experience. And then you don't really want to work with in either of those cases. And then finally, if they haven't... Uh, if they haven't answered the question that you asked, then again, they haven't read. It, it's a surefire way to know that people can't read instructions and they can't follow instructions. So if you get the person that ticks all those three boxes where they've used your name, where they've you know, conveyed their actual experience in the specific task that you're offering in the job description, and they answer your question that you've said that, you know, when you respond, please answer this question, then you can pretty much say that you're at the Pro, that, the point where those are your filters, you know, those are the ones. So anybody who passes those three tasks, you can put them in this pool, and then you've got your options about where to go you know, forward next. And what I would do is I would say, you know, even if you get like, you know, a hundred people replying, you probably only have two or three that actually, you know, did what you wanted to see at the end. So then start those people off, just say, you know, I'm really excited about this. I've got some other candidates and I'd really like to give you just a small task just to see how you get on and see how you do. So then you start them off with a very small task. If you have to pay three people to do the same task, do that. It's worth the investment. You know, it's worth investing that money. So you definitely right pay off. these people for that small task. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Mm. And um, is it like an I, hour? How big is that task? Give us an example. It depends. It depends on what the job is specifically. Um, but I will try to restrict it to maybe less than $50 or one or two hours or three hours. It depends. But if you can keep it capped at less than $50, um, then that would be a good starting point. And you could even say to that person, you know, I need this task done. You know, how much would you charge me just for this one task so I can, you know, I can test the waters with you and then just see what they come back with. Um, it depends whether you're paying pe people by the project or by the hour. But 
I will start off with something small and I will generally give it to everyone. And that's my investment of how I get to find a really, really good person. Um, then I will obviously get the work back and I will see, you know, how people did in terms of time scales, in terms of cost, in terms of working with them, how, how were they, what was the communication like, you know, all these things that are very, very important for moving forward. And then you make your choice based on that. It won't always be right using that method, but I would say 90% of the time you'll find your guy if you follow those steps. And how do you ensure a lot of people who hire somebody, they come out of the, the gates, like just like a horse at the racetrack and it's amazing. And then they, their dependability kind of goes out the window. Do you have any advice to, <laughs> to, to <laughs> save people that pain? Okay. Well, first of all, you know, people are either reliable or they're not, you know, I think it's inherent in us, but the, the way that you can really ensure somebody's loyalty is to make sure that you pay them enough. Um, you know, if you try and go in for a start and, and try and undercut someone, you know, I, I have so many people come to me and say, well, you know, I, I want to use your services, but I can't afford that rate. So can you give me a discount? It's like, no, because I need to charge that rate in order to provide you with the type of service that you're going to be looking for. So you might get VAs who are very, very, you know, fresh, I call them fresh VAs, um, who are really looking to just kind of take on clients. And as their business kind of grows and builds, those people and those clients that they started um, charging very low rates for will kind of get undercut by the other clients coming in who are sort of paying the higher rates. So I would say the best thing to do is always make sure that your VA is happy with the rate that she's getting and don't go asking for too many discounts. If the rate isn't working for you, go and find another VA who is, who is paying the kind of rate that you can afford comfortably. Um, and then once you were able to do that, you know, you have to take care of them. The best thing that you can do is respect them as if they were an equal. Um, because if you respect their time, if you, you know, the way you want your time respected, if you respect, you know, the, their business hours and things like that, you know, you will get the same respect from them. They will basically, when you're in the client VA relationship, it's it's not like an employee and an employer. Um, it's a completely different dynamic because you are not employing someone. You are hiring someone on a contractual basis and they're not tied to you in any way. They're not married to you. So what you have to do is just make sure that you are keeping those people happy and you're respecting their boundaries. And from there, once you get that, you know, a VA will pretty much do anything for the clients that are really kind of showing that they've they've got a human side to them and that, you know, aren't demanding and, you know, expecting too many things um, in too little time, that type of thing. So it's about gaining a very, very mutual respect from the VA. You know, you have to earn the respect of the VA. It's not just you're paying them to do a job and, you know, it should get done. It's about how can I treat my VA better so she treats me better or he. And how do you manage all of your VAs, keep them organized and, and things like that? Um, through project management systems. Um, basically, I have a, an online project management system called Active Collab, which we have all our clients in and all the team in. And that's where we kind of process tickets and tasks. Um, and then to save time, I, I absolutely hate email. Um, it Me does too. my head in. That's why I'm asking <laughs> this, because I cannot stand emails flying back and forth. It drives me wild. Yeah. So to resolve that, you can get a sort of online chat room. The one I use is called Unison at unison.com. And it's an online kind of chat room for, where you set up different rooms about different projects, different topics, that type of thing. And then you, it's a bit like Twitter where you at reply people in. So you have all your team inside this room and then you at reply Joe or at reply Megan, and then you send them a message and that will go to their email. But what you can do then is just, if you get loads of those messages, you delete them all, go directly into the project space and, and, you know, see a list of messages and reply. So I use Unison basically to replace email um, with my team and that works really well. And then we can organize everything and we've got a history of it. And I also have a, a really kind of robust support desk as well, help desk with ticket numbers, because I found that 
Um, if you give everything a reference number, you can find it really, really quickly. So um, when we get you know, anything, any correspondence coming back and forth, any inquiries, you know, anybody requesting tasks, everything gets a ticket number generated. And we kind of use that ticket number as a way to track, you know, how things are going and, you know, track emails and things like that. So I guess that's my top three productivity tips. Um, get a project space, get an online team chat room and, you know, get ticket IDs on your correspondence. So you're able to just search for them really quickly. And uh, oh, that, that's, that's interesting that there are three different tools. And is there a reason why there's three different tools and not just one Uber tool? Uh, because it's not out there yet. <laughs> I'd like to develop it myself. I've, hmm. been, I've had the idea for a long time now. And um, it's just not something, you know, software isn't my thing. And, and I guess I could develop something. But um, right now, yeah, I'm using three tools to do one job. And um, there are kind of plugins and add-ons that people have generated or created for, for the project management space in particular. Um, but I, I haven't found something. I need these systems to do very specific things, and I haven't yet found one that does all of them. But, you know, I'm 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 on it, you know. I'm obsessed with this kind of thing, and if I ever do, I'll like be rejoicing. If I don't, in the next couple of years, I might might go ahead and start making something myself. Well, I'm using I'm testing Trello right now. Somebody was recommended by a guy I interviewed who is the founder of Cart Cart Stack, and I'm loving Trello. But it doesn't have a help desk in it, but all the other things yeah. it, it has, it's, it's pretty cool. Um. <sighs> Skills or attitude? What comes first and what do you hire for? Uh, to me, attitude always comes first um, because that's where, that's where you'll get the long-term sustainability of anybody. Skills can be learned, but attitude generally can't. So, you know, if you find someone with the right attitude, take the, invest in training them, you know, invest in them, um, teach them the skills that you need because, you know, the attitude is what's going to keep you know, keep you going in the long term. It's what's going to keep them, you know, coming into work on time. It's what's going to keep getting the job done. Um, skills doesn't get the job done in terms of, you know, consistency. And what kind of attitude are you looking for? I mean, the attitude is a very broad thing. What kind of attitude makes somebody attractive to join your team? Um, I really like people who are kind of entrepreneurial, um, when I'm hiring people for my own team, I there are there are three different classes of virtual assistant out there. I don't want to, you know, get into the kind of training mode too much. But you've got like the innovators, the people who really want to want to push forward and want to be innovating in the industry and you know coming up with new ideas, how to service clients, new service offerings, that type of thing. But everyone has to start somewhere. So they start off generally as a supporter. And I call supporters people who really want to expand and grow their business, but they're not quite there yet. They need the learning. Then there's suppliers, which are, you know, things like Chris Tucker's you know, virtual staff finder and things like that. So what I tend to do is I hire what I call supporters, which are people who are, who are ambitious, who do want to get ahead because those are the people who will keep turning up on time. Those are the people who will um, want to improve themselves, want to better themselves. You know, what I'm looking for is VAs who don't do things because they have to, but they do things because they want to, because they know it's going to improve themselves. They know if they keep repeating the same task over again, they'll get better and better at it. And then m maybe one day they'll be able to teach other people how to do it or maybe one day they'll be able to, be able to charge more for it. You know, I have absolutely no bones about people I hire moving on to bigger and better things after they work with me. And, you know, you know, a lot of people are like, you know, oh, I got to hire one virtual assistant and she's got to stay with me forever and things like that. No, you know, help people grow, help people to learn, help people to be better because those are the people who have the attitude that you really, really need in your business, who care about your business as much as you do. Um, and then once you find those people who, who have the attitude of caring, of wanting to improve themselves, of wanting to, and knowing that improving your business is how they improve themselves, you know, then that's it. That's, you know, what you want in a box. Michelle, talk about the, your first uh, training product that you put out there. 
Oh, that's really cool, actually. This is, this is, I'll tell you a story about this, and I'm sure people will find it, you know, quite inspiring. Um, okay, first of all, I used to get asked loads of questions from virtual assistants about how they could start setting up their business online, how, how I did what I did. And this is before I was even publishing figures. Um, you know, three years into my business, I decided I was going to start, you know, doing a training program to kind of answer all these questions that I was getting because I just didn't have the time to service my clients and to, you know, service the VA industry as well by answering everyone's individual questions over again. So that's when I came up with the idea to create a training product. And basically what I did was, you know, I put, you know, put out all these modules and everything that I was going to teach. And I, I wasn't into list building or anything back then. I was servicing clients and that was my focus. So I thought to myself, right, I'll, I'm going to need a list here. So I started blogging and I started getting, you know, I got, I got a moderate list of a couple of hundred people. And um, then I decided what I would do is I would do a promotion where, you know, people could apply and I would give away so many spaces on my initial training product. So people applied and I had a list of 34 people who applied. Seven of those people, I gave away the training products on a beta testing for free. And the others, I sent out list, you know, I basically 19 people applied. So I sent out the list to the others um, and I basically, you know, said, I sent out the list of the 34 people and I said, I've given away my seven places, but if anybody else wants to come on, it's $1,000. If you want to come on the beta testing, you know, I'm going to sell this product for $2,000 when it goes live, but you can have it for a thousand if you come on the beta testing. Out of that tiny little list of 34 people, I made $19,000. That's incredible. And, and, yeah, I know. So, and, oh, and sorry, was, you're saying that you, on 100% conversion rate, 19 out of 19 people. No, thir- there was a list of 34 people. Right. Seven were given away. Yeah. And then I, out of the remaining people, I had $19,000 worth of business. 19 people bought, sorry. 19 right. people oh, bought. Got it. That's incredible. So, yeah, it was, it was incredible. And I had no idea that that was possible. I mean, bearing in mind, this, this, I never went into that venture thinking to myself I could make money from it. It was just an idea, and I thought, well, if anybody wants it, that's fine. And what did it um, look like? Then, what was it? Videos? Was it PDFs? What did it look like? It's um, – okay, it's, if anybody wants to go and look at it now, it's at thevaapprentice.com. And I've, I've now got a whole series of them, but that was my original one. And what it was, it, it was a combination of – business building and learning. So basically it was seven modules and they each had five lessons in and it took you from building a virtual assistant business from start to finish, right from, you know, the first sort of planning stages to the mindset that you have to have going into it right at the end to actually having your business online and ready to go. And I also provide us, I, I provided a virtual assistant service in there where we also got my team involved and we started building, you know, their social media accounts for them and their business for them and that type of thing. So it was a combination of a little bit of learning, a little bit of services. Um, but at that time, I realized that if I was going to sell this product and, you know, I'm sure that, you know, in your interviews, people have talked about social proof before. I thought to myself, if I'm going to sell this product, I really, really have to find a way of getting the social proof out there. So what I did was I printed off one month of invoices from my, I use an account called FreshBooks to send invoices. So I printed off one month of all the invoices and I blanked out all the names and everything like that. It was $20,000. So everyone was, you know, looking at my invoices going, oh my God, if I take this program, I'm going to make $20,000. You know? And disclaimer. We, we, had some, yeah, I know. And so we had some really good success stories. You know, people have now become digital nomads. They've quit their jobs, um, doubled their income. You know, one woman on my site doubled their income in uh, a month, in 30 days, and then doubled it again in 30 days. So, you know, I, when people apply these things, you know, they get results. It's like anything. So, um, yeah, so from there, that, that started, I, I got a real buzz about selling products from there. And then I started creating more products and I started getting into launches because, you know, basically what I did was from sending pretty much one or two emails, I made $19,000 where I was working for an entire month <laughs> for $19,000. So to me, that was just, you know, that was like a revolution. I didn't even know that that could be done at the time. It was, it was kind of new to me. And a then I started. A moment 
for sure. Yeah, it was a total light bulb moment. It was, and I and I realized then I should be doing more training. And, so, and now I do mentorship and, you know, I sell my mentorship programs for a couple of thousand pounds, which is, you know, a few thousand dollars. And um, it's, it's, it's kind of expanded and grown. And I think the best thing that you could do, the thing that I wish I'd done really a long time ago, you know, was to actually think about how you can make, you know, how many dinners can you make out of one chicken? How many revenue streams can you bring in from that one skill that you have? And um, that really started off. So now I have, I do consulting, I do products, I do training programs, mentorship, you know, anything that I can think of that I can make money from, from this, you know, talent I have, you know, I do it. and, And that's really what everybody should be thinking about. How many dinners can you have from this one chicken? Is that what you said? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I've never heard that before, but good lesson, good analogy. So <laughs> you sell that all off of your website. It, now, is that is that true? Yes. Yeah, I sell all those things from my website, that one website. And it started with this just kind of little humble blog, um, you know, well, that was about virtual assistants just to try and attract a few virtual assistants onto a mailing list. Uh, yeah, so it's it's grown from strength to strength, and and now it's a you know primary source of my income. Are you ever concerned that you providing this kind of training for people basically increases the competition for you? It's kind of like you're almost training the competition. No, absolutely not. Because again, it, it's like I am. I always make sure I'm one step ahead. There's nobody. There's nobody who's in front of me. You know, there are successful virtual assistants out there. Don't get me wrong. But in my specific niche of virtual assistants, you know, I focus really on the freedom lifestyle. Um, I focus a, a lot on mindset, entrepreneurial virtual assistants. You know, so that's me. That's my thing. And you know. The more I focus on it, the more I sort of immerse myself into it and try and be better at it. You know, I, it kind of, there's nobody else really out there doing what I'm doing. So in terms of competition for, you know, selling services, I want people to get better. I want the industry to get better as a whole. It's a bigger picture than just me. Okay. You know, I think once you get to a certain threshold of income, you start stop think to stop thinking about the money. And then you start thinking about, you know, what can I actually do to people? So the way I see it is that if I can train one person and then they can quit their job and stay at home with their kids, or if I can train another person and they can quit their job and start traveling or, you know, any, kind of way of improving somebody else's life is way more important to me than the competition. And, you know, I think, I think we all need to have a bigger picture attitude in terms of, you know, in terms of making money. And, and you have to understand, Jason, as soon as I started having that mindset, um, I started making a shitload more money. And just encapsulate that mindset once again. So make sure that everybody, including myself, gets it. Okay, there is no competition. Consistently try to improve yourself and be at the forefront of your game. Do your very, very best and help as many people in as many ways as you possibly can. What is your mindset around money? That's a very broad question and answer it any way you want. Uh, I used to hate money and now I love it. <laughs> uh, it used to be the, It used to be about paying bills, never enough. Um, it was like a noose around my neck. I always needed it and I never had it. Um, you know, big mortgages, that type of thing. And as soon as I became detached from money and I started to see it, not so much as the enemy that was never around, but something that I, you know, I needed to learn to love money for money to love me. And, you know, basically what I I did is I, I started thinking more about all the different ways I could make money rather than all the different ways. I wasn't making money or I didn't have money. So I, the thing about money is if you really, really want to make money, then you have to think about what the hell you can do in exchange for it because it's not going to just walk into your life unless you win the lottery, of course, which, you know, how many people do. So as soon as I started focusing more about, okay, what can I do in exchange for money? What can I, what can I do to people's lives that people would pay me money for? And as soon as it's like an exchange of energy, you know, people you know, many, many years ago used to exchange seeds for, you know, cows or something like that, you know, and the way I see it is I'm exchanging skills for, 
cash. And, you know, as soon as you get that kind of detachment from it, you know, and you, you don't get so desperate for it and you realize, okay, well, all I have to do is provide value, then, you know, money becomes great. And I, and now I love it. (laughs) And what was your holy shit, I've made it moment? Um, actually the, the, the moment where I realized I, I made 19 grand from a couple of emails was one of those moments. Um, but I think the first time that I published, um, my income report, no, I, as, as far as I'm aware, no other virtual assistant out there has published an income report of the invoices that she's generated from a clients. So that was one of those moments where some, you know, a lot of people were coming to me going, I had no idea that you can make 20 grand a month from being a virtual assistant. Um, and I think that was the moment that I realized that I was actually doing better than I, than I thought I was, you know, we, we tend to be modest a lot of the times, you know, uh, you know, a, a lot of people I train and I teach, um, and, and specifically mental, they say, well, you know, I, I can do this and, but you know, everybody knows how to do that. And it's like, no, they don't, you know, they don't know how to do that. You know, you need to give yourself more credit. And I, and I realized at that point that I wasn't really giving myself enough credit because at that time, you know, and bearing in mind that was in 2010. So that was five years ago there weren't virtual assistants making 20 grand a month. Uh, They were making 20 grand a year. Um, So that's one of the moments where I thought, you know, aha, I've done it. And then actually last year I was traveling in Egypt. I was creating some more. I was launching three big training programs and I decided to publish another income report. Um, It was like three years later. It was exactly three years later from the time that I published my first one. And, you know, the results of that were, you know, you know, over $32,000 that I was making just from services. Um, And again, that, you know, that got a lot of interest. Interest and, and, and that, you know, just publishing that income report and publishing that proof led me on to another, you know, over $30,000, you know, product launch last year. So um, it's, it's really about, you know, I'm not saying this to impress people. I'm saying this to impress upon people that as long as you do well, you focus on what you're doing and focus on getting better, you'll be able to charge more money. And, you know, if you get the social proof to back it up, your business will take off. It has to. As well, I would imagine having that belief that what you're doing is valuable and provides value to somebody. Yeah. And seriously, Jason, I mean, belief is a whole other topic, but if you do not have that belief that you can actually make any kind of money, if you, you know, if you sit there saying to yourself, well, I hope I'm going to make a million, um, or I hope I'm going to make 10 grand a month even, or I hope I'm going to make 50 grand a year, you know, the hope is not going to get you anywhere. The, the must is going to get you where you need to be. I must make 10 grand a month. I must make 50 grand a year. And, you know, I must provide, you know, the exact direct equivalent or more in exchange, you know, for what I'm doing. So, um, yeah, believe in yourself and believe that it's possible. Believing in the possibility is the first hurdle, you know, because so many people are bogged down. A lot, a lot of people are in their jobs right now. You know, they, all they're seeing is their income that's capped, that they can't earn any more money. Um, and really it, it prevents people from thinking outside the box. As soon as you believe that there is more out there for you, that there is more possibility for you, as soon as you start to believe that, you will start seeing so many things that you never saw before. So many opportunities, um, you know, ideas will start coming to you that you've never had before. And, and it all starts to flow very easily. But the whole time that you're not truly believing it and you're just hoping things will happen, you know, it's like all of those things are being blocked. Uh, I'll just add to that very, very simple uh, language shift is stop using the word hope or I want more money because what you get is a state of more wanting more. Exactly. Exactly. I don't know a single, I don't know a single successful entrepreneur who wouldn't agree with that. Absolutely. And, you know, I, I went through a stage in my life where I was constantly wanting and the more I wanted, the more I wanted. Um, and that was basically how it went. And then what I, you know, what I did, you have to have that complete shift in mindset where, where you focus on the outcome, where you focus on not what you want, but what you are going to have, you know, it's like changing from, you know, a can to a will. And, And once you do that, you know, there is no other option. If you keep, you know, another thing for me was I stopped making backup plans. I always used to, you know, plan everything to the last minute. And then I would have this backup plan if it didn't work out, you know, and then I was just like, well, 
I'm making a plan to fail, basically. <laughs> I have. I can totally relate to that because I actually wrote it down this morning, ironically, because my father used to always say, you know, you know what, make sure you have something to fall back on. Yeah, I know. Well, we're all raised like that, right? And why is no, that? Like... Okay, talk about it a little bit more. Like, why is that a, a potentially dangerous thing? Because it doesn't. It sounds very prudent. Have something to fall back on. Have a backup plan. Yeah. Well, the thing is that the, the whole thing about being successful is expectation. If you expect to be successful, you will be successful. Now, you have to ask yourself, is creating a backup plan expecting success? No, it's expecting that something's going to go wrong and you're going to need it. So, so that's, the, that's the whole premise of it. You know, if you want to be successful, you have to eliminate every other option. You have to burn your bridges behind you and keep walking forward. Then you, you, there is no going back. <laughs> that's the definition of burning your bridges or burning the ships at the shore. Who was it that invaded or took his troops somewhere and then burned the ships behind them? Yeah, I, I should know this. It's probably a, probably a Greek Perhaps, yeah. I'm in Greece right now, actually. No. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no way. Where are you? Um, Crete, the island of Crete. Oh, I haven't been there. I am Greek, half Greek. <laughs> um, oh, right. Yeah. So, wow. Then, how do you like it? Yeah, I love it. We've been um, in and out of Greece now for a couple of years. Um, and we keep coming back here. This is the first country that we come back to. Mm -hmm. You know, we travel. So, we, we travel around like every year 18 months two years um so we never really in the same place for very long and you know like i say my my kids have been born on the road and things like that so but yeah greece is the only place where we're like you know we've we've got a little piece of our heart here and um we're finding it awesome and, and we just keep coming back so yeah um i i really really enjoy it here that's interesting a lot of men with mustaches on crete yeah, <laughs> beards, actually. They have the full beard. Oh, yeah? My oh. husband's actually got a beard as well now. He looks uh, Greek, so we blend have, in. They have that big knife stuff stuck in their boot. Anyway, let's get back on the... How? Any advice for people who want to be entrepreneurial nomads working from... How do you do it? I mean, there, it's... You know, I, I'm equipped. I have a laptop and a cell phone. I, I don't even need to bring my laptop. I can work. But what's your tips? Um, well, first of all, I mean, in terms of logistics, you know, obviously you need to have technology and you need to make sure that you've got an internet connection. Um, pretty much once I make sure those two things are covered, I can work from anywhere. Um, and you have to really, really get familiar with using a computer and technology. You cannot be a technophobe and live this kind of lifestyle. Um, and you have to really, really enjoy it. You know, I mean, I've, you know, worked with um, virtual assistants or, you know, PAs who want to become VAs. Um, and they're always consistently talking about going to see their clients or, you know, having insurance for their office and things like that, you know, and it's like, you know, work from a cafe, just, you know, you know, but it's too far outside of their comfort zone to be able to go and do that. You know, they're like, Oh, I can't, I need my printer. Um, I don't even own a printer. <laughs> so, um, are the people who ask fax machine, I'm like, really? Where, yeah, I know. How old are you? I know, I know. And it's like my online banking that they, they always ask me to fax everything. And it's just like, God, <laughs> well, you've got online banking and then oh. you want it faxed. Oh, that? I, I <laughs> went through this with a merchant account and then you'd fa I finally fax it to them. And oh, wait, I didn't find it. I'm like, well, jump in <laughs> to today, please. I know. I know. This is why I really like online fax services because I can never get to a fax machine. Oh, yeah. I can't actually get to a fax machine, you know, from anywhere I am. It's just too much hassle. So, um, you know, asking for someone for a fax machine in Greek, no, oh, it's forget. not going to happen. Do, uh, do, you, do you know any Greek? <laughs> I know a little bit. I know enough to get to the supermarket and order some food and yeah. that type of thing. I was but, in you know, a, that. But my was... kids are fluent Greek now. <laughs> get out of here. Yeah, both really? of them. Yeah, not all three of them, because obviously my youngest is only um, six months. But uh, my my two eldest, they're um, six and seven. They're fluent. They were fluent within a year, and they go to Greek school now. So Well, the irony is that almost everybody in Greece who's relatively young can speak English. Any other advice on working digitally or being a digital nomad for people? <sighs> um yeah, sure. Um, obviously, you've got to think about ideas. To, you know, in terms of being a digital nomad, you don't have to obviously offer services online. There are there are a million other ways to earn money online. Um, you have to find what's 
well, the one that's right for you. When I, when I went out to Egypt, the first thing I started doing was selling Egyptian rugs on eBay and things like that. So, you know, think about all the various different ways that you could possibly make money online and, you know, try them out and see what one's for you. Um, and obviously you've got to be able to step outside of your comfort zone. A lot of people have, you know, dream about becoming a digital nomad, dream about traveling and living in this kind of lifestyle, living in different countries, but they put so many blocks in front of their way that they'll never actually get there. Um, so you've got to try and find a way to actually remove those blocks and remove those fears of actually going for it and doing it. Because, you know, the biggest, the biggest thing about getting started is just making that first trip. You know, once you've done that, everything else just falls into place and becomes a lot easier. So, you know, feel the fear and do it anyway. And, you know, you will get the rewards for stepping outside of your comfort zone um, to become a digital nomad. And a lot of people ask me as well, this is another question that comes up. So I'll, you know, I'll kind of answer it in advance for people. But a lot of people ask me, how much money they actually need to start traveling. Um, and you know, I started traveling with nothing. So, you know, I <laughs> like, you know, I'm talking like spare change. So it's, you, it's, it's all about your attitude towards it. If you believe that you can make money and you can do it working online and there is no other option for you, then, you know, you will do it. So in terms of how much money you need to get started or how much money you need to start a business even, you know, I can get VA started for a hundred dollars if they, if they need to. So, you know, just kind of get over your fears. Well, Michelle, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for being on Self Made. If you're interested in not going through the pain of hiring an awesome virtual assistant, then go to virtualmissfriday.com. Michelle, thank you very much for being on Self Made. Thank you. If you want to get into the high end virtual assistant game and work from anywhere on a laptop, and learn from the best, Michelle, then just go to www.jasonbax.com. That's B-A-X, jasonbax.com forward slash V-A blueprint. And that'll take you right to Michelle's course on what you need to do, the step-by-step blueprint to go from zero customers, zero clients, to building a very successful virtual assistant business and start getting paid what you're worth. And for most people, going from self or, or employment, going from a job or underemployment to self-employment, the easiest step for them is to start a service-based business. Well, this is the guy that will help you do that. This is where Michelle, she talked about the part of her business was was training people in this this industry. And she sells that training. If you go to www.com forward slash jasonbacks.com forward slash VA blueprint, you can get access to that course. And it's just another way that you can support this podcast. Thanks for listening to Self Made, hosted by Jason Bax. You can thank the guest and spread their story by sharing this episode on Twitter, Google Plus, or Facebook. Subscribing to Self Made means you'll never miss an idea. Each episode will magically appear on your phone or computer. Hey, you never know. The next guest could inspire your next big idea.